Okay, well, my computer says two o'clock and computers are always right. So let's start this program. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you to everybody for coming today. Today we are doing a soldier's footsteps through World War II. Um, sorry, people keep coming in, so I'm trying to admit them while talking. Um, as you have probably noticed, I have everybody muted. We do have a, a very full house today. We have 30 people here um, already um, with another, there, there are 50 people signed up, so we could get you know even more people coming. So Marty is able to answer questions during her presentation. The way that you're gonna submit a question is by using your chat function. And then I will wait for a break in Marty's presentation to ask you a question of her. Marty is sharing her screen, um, so she does not have the, sh the chat function open. So again, I'll be verbalizing your questions to her. So feel free to type them into me. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, feel free to type that in the chat function as well, and I'll help you as best I can. Um, after the program, um, I'm going to put up a QR code on my screen. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and that code links you to a survey about the program. I'm also going to put a link to that same survey in the chat function. Um, so you can either use the QR code to access the survey or the link in the chat function. Um, the more feedback, the better. We're always trying to, we're always learning from the patrons about what we can do better um, and what they'd like to see. So please, uh, please feel free. We encourage you to take that survey. Um, now I am going to give a brief bio on Marty after I admit these last couple people here. And then I'm gonna throw it right over to her. So let's see here. Marty Briggs Brown was born on a farm in central Illinois and has lived in DeKalb with her husband, Charlie and family since 1978. She recently became the curator of over 300 letters written by her father as he trained as a soldier and then served as a captain in World War II in, U in Europe. Her father, Lou Briggs, was very detailed at preserving his college and work experiences in scrapbooks, and Marty has those in her collection as well. After putting the letters in chronological order, she used the letters and scrapbooks to write a narrative of her father's experience during this important time in our nation's history. The book was finished about a year ago and was self-published on Amazon entitled From Cornfield to Battlefield. Marty has, has prepared for us a slideshow of her father's experiences as a soldier and in, uh, a soldier in Europe and the journey that she and her sisters took to retrace her father's footsteps during this pivotal moment in our nation's history. Today marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. So with that and without any further ado, I am going to turn this over to Marty. I will be turning off my camera and muting myself, but I am here if you need assistance and I am here to verbalize questions as well. So Marty, it is all yours. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me for this program hosted by the DeKalb Public Library. I will be presenting a slideshow entitled, A Soldier's Footsteps Through World War II. And if you have any comments or questions, you can turn them over to Samantha and she'll relay these to me as we go along. As you see on the screen, this is a picture of my dad, Lewis Briggs, which was taken in Europe in the fall of 1944. My father grew up on a family farm near Stonington, Illinois, south of Decatur. He was the only surviving son on the farm and his own father died when my dad was seven. He graduated from Stonington High School in 1938, and it would have been natural for him to stay home and farm the land and raise the farm animals, but he was encouraged by his high school agriculture teacher to go to college. Dad enrolled in the University of Illinois that fall, majoring in agriculture and animal science, agriculture economics and animal science. At that time, enrollment in the Reserve Officers Training Corps, commonly known as ROTC, was required of all able-bodied males for the first two years of college. However, with war threatening during the summer of 1941, Congress passed a conscription law bill that exempted advanced course ROTC cadets from the draft if they stayed in ROTC for their junior and senior years. 
Dad opted to extend his ROT tra ROTC training. And these photos show him in an ROTC camp, Camp McCoy in Wisconsin, just prior to his senior year. Here he had experience with firing the big guns. And you can see him also training with the gas masks. As dad completed his senior year at U of I, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And the day after graduation, he drove down to Fort Seal, Oklahoma to report for duty. He was trained in the battery officers course and was later assigned to teach this same course to new officers and also train officers in artillery operation. The newest mapping invention at that time was the Odograph. You could say it was an early form of today's Google Maps. The purpose was to plot the course and distance traveled by a vehicle. It was mounted on a Jeep, as you can see in the photo here. So in the back of the Jeep would be the Odograph. My dad met my mom, Helen Louise McClellan, in college. She was majoring in home economics education. They became engaged in late 1942 as so many couples did during those months after Pearl Harbor occurred. And dad was granted a 10 day leave for their wedding on June 15th, 1943 in Argenna, Illinois. And as you can see, it was a double wedding. Mom's sister Beatrice married Lieutenant Irwin Davenport in this double ceremony. Irwin was stationed in Camp Stewart, Georgia. A few days after the wedding, my parents went back down to Fort Sill because he was still teaching artillery on that base. In November 1943, he received notice that he was to join the 268th Artillery Battalion at Camp Walters, Texas. Dad would be with this group of men for the rest of his active duty, and Mom became acquainted with the men and their wives. She was also trained as a Red Cross volunteer. The battalion was then assigned to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and eventually moved to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. This was the staging area for the battalion as they prepared to depart for Europe. Their ship, the Aquitania, sailed on July 15, 1944. Our mother returned to Illinois to teach home economics at Niantic High School in Illinois. This slide is a brief summary of my father's experience in the European theater. The 268th Battalion was part of the first army under General Hodges. Their active involvement in the war dated from August 1944 through September 1945. There were three batteries in this battalion, which was commanded by Colonel Arthur Blair. They saw action in four battles in France, in Belgium, the Netherlands, and in Germany. The badge that he wore showed those four stars. So here you can see his badge with the four stars. And also he had his captain's bars and those would have been on his helmet or on his helmet and also on his jacket. We are fortunate to have his archives that document his time from his training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma and Camp Walters, Texas all the way to the deployment overseas. And we have a collection of hundreds of letters that he wrote to my mother, who was his young wife, and also to his two sisters and his, his mother and grandmother. And we also have two scrapbooks that he made when he returned home, as well as many other artifacts. His war scrapbook contains the maps showing his movement through Europe. So I assembled these primary source materials and I wrote a book about his experiences. Well, we sisters decided that we would like to use these documents to plan a trip to Europe to follow his footsteps. And here we are. We're meeting at the Atlantic, at Atlanta airport for our flight to Paris in late August 2018. So from left to right, Nancy Briggs, Bev Briggs, myself in the middle, Margie Briggs Casson, and Nancy Briggs Carlson. When we arrived in Normandy, France, we hired a private guide to give us a tour of the famous World War II sites. We visited Utah Beach, which is where dad and the 20, 268th Battalion landed. They didn't land on D-Day, but on August 27th, 1944. 
Dad wrote that it was still unnerving to be sitting on the beach that day, the day they arrived, waiting for the rest of the battalion to land. So they moved a bit inland to take cover. During our tour, we spent some quiet time on the beach, which was practically deserted, to reflect on his arrival at Utah Beach and his presence in the sacred place where so many had died. And you could see this is the beach here. A door at a restaurant serves as a place for those who are visiting to honor their family members by adding their name. So we added dad's name to the door. We stopped at Omaha Beach and we were surprised and a bit dismayed at the commercialism there, but we saw another sculpture depicting the horror of D-Day. And then we also went to the cemetery for their sunset ceremony of lowering the flag. And you can see we're standing next to a gun that would be similar in size to the one that uh, our dad was commanding. And here is a picture of the act, one of the actual guns. The 268th Battalion led by Colonel Arthur Blair consisted of three batteries, A, B, and C. And each battery had two of these big guns. The range of the gun was up to 20 miles. We traveled on to Saint Malo in France, on the coast of France, and that's the setting for the bestseller book, All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, which tells the story of the German occupation of Saint Malo during World War II and its liberation. And this is where dad's battalion fought its first battle of the war. The German army had already been defeated in Saint Malo by the time that dad's company arrived, but there was a little holdout of German and Italian soldiers that hadn't yet surrendered on an island off the coast. And this was the Isle of Sazambra, and here is the isle here, you can see from the coast. So we sisters took a water taxi out to the island of Sazambra for a closer look. Dad's battalion had been positioned on the French coast, firing their eight inch shells across to the island to pressure the surrender of the Germans and Italians who were firing anti-aircraft missiles at the Allied planes. As we arrived on the island, we were cautioned to stay on the island path and not to stray off it because there were still active mines on the island, even in 2018. The island is uninhabited today. As we walked the path, we saw bunkers and rusted war equipment. The view of the English Channel was spectacular. Dad had written in a letter home that after the Germans and Italians surrendered, he and his buddies had to take a boat over to the island. And he described the same sights that we were seeing. Shelled bunkers, destroyed machinery, and craters where bombs and shells had fallen. Well, we were indeed walking in our father's footsteps on this island. A map from his scrapbook guided us in our planning of, this, of our trip. So here's where he landed and his battalion arrived on Utah Beach and then they traveled west to Brittany and that's where Saint Malo is. And then after that battle, they hauled their artillery equipment across France and then up to Belgium and into the Netherlands where they were positioned across from Aachen, Germany. And as they moved across France, they paused briefly for showers and a brief rest, much needed rest at Versailles before continuing north to Belgium. So we sisters stayed in Versailles and we took time to tour the palace and even see the sights of Paris. This is one of my favorite slides. Dad's black and white photos are on top and they correspond with the colored photos of us on the bottom. At this point, there were six of us on the trip because my daughter, Laura, joined us from her home in Amsterdam. So here's dad in an outdoor cafe, and here we are in an out outdoor cafe. And here's dad and his war buddies um, look overlooking the balcony of, at uh, Sacre Coeur. And here we are, same place exactly. And then we also, of course, saw the Arc de Triomphe. Dad's battalion was in bivouac in Erlen, the Netherlands, for about six weeks during the attack on Aachen, Germany. Erlen is in that part of the Netherlands that dips down between Belgium and Germany. So in about 10 minutes in any direction, one can be in any one of these countries. So the battalion headquarters occupied a schoolhouse, and this was where Dad received his promotion to captain in the middle of September. 
He mentioned in his scrapbook that he went shopping at a department store in Harlan called Chunks, and he actually sent us a post or sent back a postcard of that. It was nicknamed the Glass Palace. It was blown up during those weeks, unfortunately, but rebuilt after the war. So we were curious to see it. And it looks like the original building. When we went to Harlan, we took a picture of what Shunk looks like today. But now it's a multicultural center uh, for art and music and dance. While we had lunch on the square, we got a chance to visit with a woman sitting at the next table. And when she found out about our journey, she told us that she had been born in a bomb shelter in Harlan on October 6th, 1944. And our dad would have been in the city at that time. We traveled into Germany and we stayed in a place on the edge of the Hurtgen Forest. Dad's battalion spent several weeks firing on the German border city of Aachen. After the city fell to the Allied forces, the battalion moved into the Hurtgen Forest where there was some of the most brutal fighting of the war. Thousands of American and German lives were lost. The goal of the First Army was to cross the Rhine River and push east to Berlin. So on this map here is Aachen, and this is the Hurtgen Forest, and then here is the Rhine River. And of course, that was a big deal to finally, eventually, not yet, cross the Rhine and head toward Berlin. But the Allies were pushed back by the Germans in a surprise maneuver known as the Battle of the Bulge. And you can see why it was called the Bulge. These maps were in Dad's scrapbook. On Christmas Day, 1944, the 268th Battalion was fighting in a small German village of Lukum. At that time, Dad had been assigned as a communications liaison to field artillery headquarters, representing his battalion in a nearby encampment. So he was away from the command post when he heard over the radio that Barnyard 6 had been hit, and he knew that his command post had been shelled. So he rushed back and found that Colonel Blair had been killed instantly and that Captain Brockler had been mortally wounded. Dad was able to visit his buddy, Captain Brockler, before he died soon after. We stopped at the park in Lucum, and I read from my manuscript about that Christmas day. The realization really hit home to us that with only a little bit of luck, it wasn't our father who was killed. He most certainly would have been killed or wounded had he been at the command post at that terrible moment. On that day, Dad was given command of Battery B and would lead 110 men during the firing on the Germans during the Battle of the Bulge. He was only 24 years old. We visited three more American cemeteries, one in Luxembourg, where General George Patton is buried, and one in Belgium, the Henri Chapelle American Cemetery, where Colonel Blair is buried, and the American Cemetery in Margraten, Netherlands, where Captain Brockler is buried. We placed red roses on the graves of Blair and Brockler. Those were sobering moments. We traveled into Belgium, into the location of the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes Forest, and we spent one night in Bastogne and toured the Battle of the Bulge War Museum. In the city square in Bastogne in this, is this US tank, and you can see a shell hole in front of it. We drove north through the Ardennes and could imagine the cold, terrified soldiers trying to hide behind the trees and watching their buddies die. Dad and his battery B fired on the Germans in Belgium from the German border, approximately here. They had their two uh, eight inch guns, eight inch um, artillery guns. And by the end of 1940, or January 1945, he positioned Battery B in Belgium. So they crossed the, the border into Belgium and they were in Malmedy and Stavlat. And he wrote in his scrapbook, we battled the weather at this time more than the Germans. Zero temperatures and waist deep snow. As the bulge slowly ended, we worked our way back toward Germany. So on our trip, we drove east toward the Rhine River and we stayed at Remagen. 
and the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen was a railroad and pedestrian bridge prior to the war. Hitler had ordered his troops to blow up all the bridges, but the mission at the Remagen Bridge had failed. This bridge was the only undestroyed bridge left on the Rhine at that time. The First Army was the first to cross the bridge, and Dad saw this momentous occasion from a small plane over the river on March 7th. The bridge has never been rebuilt. You can see the picture on the left that shows what is left of the east side, and the towers on the east side have been converted into a friendship museum that tells the story of the crossing at Remagen. Dad's battalion was one of the last to cross late in March of 1944. By that time, however, the bridge had been destroyed and they crossed with their heavy tanks and guns on a pontoon bridge. Dad's letters from that spring indicate that the end of the war was near. Their guns were firing on the Ruhr Valley, just east of the Rhine. And that region, that region was a center of manufacturing and transportation and was defended fiercely by the Germans. In early May, Dad received his first leave of absence since arriving in Europe the previous July. So he went from July all the way to May with no leave of absence. He was to go to London for his leave and that's where he celebrated the end of the war with the British. He wrote to our mom, his wife, don't think I mentioned the mob of celebrating people down on Piccadilly Square the first night we were here. The VE celebration went on for two days and nights here. And this was the first time he'd ever been in London. So that was pretty exciting for him. Here's a map, it's a little hard to see that this is Remagen here. This is the Rhine River. And this is the Ruhr Valley, uh, the manufacturing and transportation area that, that the Germans were fiercely defending. And these are, this is all dad's red pencil on his maps. And so these are some of the towns that um, the 268th Battalion was stationed in. They broke into the three batteries and dad was still commanding the battery. And so uh, this top one here is, is Frankenberg and I'll be talking about that. So um, dad's battalion, when they were camped in Frankenberg uh, after the war, were really waiting for notice about whether they were to go home or whether they were to go to the Pacific. So that's where they were in May through September. Dad found a Protestant church in Frankenberg and he used to refer to it as the church on the hill in, in his letters and scrapbook. And he started attending that church whenever possible. And he wrote home about this amazing 200 year old organ that he enjoyed so much. So of course, we sisters found the church on the hill Liebfrauenkirch, and we were able to match the pictures uh, with those in his scrapbook. So this one was taken by dad, and this one was taken by one of us. You can see that it's still the same church. And we arrived on a Sunday morning, uh, and the church was unlocked right before services, so we went on in, and um, we had time for some quiet contemplation while much to our thrill, the organist started playing the beautiful old organ, some of the service music she was practicing. And we presume it was the same organ that dad had written about. That was another thrilling moment for us. And we felt his presence as we sat in that pew together. A few miles away from Frankenberg was a little village called Schrufa. And after the war, when the battalion had been disbanded, dad was still there waiting for his next orders. He became the co-commandant of an American prisoner of war camp for German soldiers. He served with a German commandant who was really the one in charge. And they were processing the German soldiers uh, out of the German army, helping them find their way home, many to homes that had been destroyed. So to keep them busy while the soldiers or the prisoners were waiting, there were various studios and workshops for them because they had various trades that, that they had before the war. One of the workshops was a wood carving shop. And one of the soldiers carved this walking stick for dad and presented it to dad 
as a present. And dad was honored and he wrote home about it in one of his letters. We remembered this walking stick when we were growing up as kids. And my sister Margie in Colorado has it in her home today. Margie and Bev, another sister, took it to the Portland Antiques Roadshow. The folk art appraisers who looked at the stick along with a picture of dad and a copy of his letter to show provenance were very interested, but they weren't chosen to be taped for the TV show. It makes a good story though. Dad's battery had several assignments besides the German prisoner camp. They monitored traffic on the Audubon and had other occupation duties. By the way, their Jeeps that they were riding in as um, occupation soldiers were not nearly as fast as the vehicles on the Audubon. So sometimes they just couldn't capture or couldn't stop them. Uh, Dad often referred to his lack of points to be able to get his honorable discharge from the army. Points for each soldier were accrued by the length of service, the number of battles fought, the length of time overseas, and whether or not they had children and how many children they had. He was also worried about being shipped to the Pacific Front during this time to join forces with another artillery battalion. But on August 14th, that's the day that the war was over. It was a day to celebrate. He could start thinking about coming home. In this slide, you can see that the formal surrender in Tokyo Bay, Japan, did not occur until September 2nd, 1945. The next month, was one of waiting and wishing that he had more points. But finally, on September 15th, he sent this note to his wife. Darling, I'm on my way home. I'm leaving today for the USA. It came suddenly. Wow, am I excited. He was to be assigned as an artillery instructor at Fort Sill. Several men from his battalion assembled in Paris, anxiously awaiting their departure. The ship took off from Le Havre, France. We also needed to head home to, <laughs> the sisters needed to pack up and go home. So we drove to the Frankfurt airport and returned our car, posing for a last picture before traveling to our respective homes the next day. Dad arrived home that fall and was officially discharged in December 1945. He and mom established their lives in the central Illinois farmhouse where he grew up. My oldest sister was born nine months later. So for them, this was the end of one story and the beginning of a new one. Five kids were born within seven years. Our dad became a full-time farmer and a leader in the community of Stonington for the remainder of his life. Shortly after he got home, dad assembled the ROTC and war scrapbooks, but did not talk about his war experiences when we were growing up. In 1983, his battalion gathered for their first reunion. Dad ended up going to six of these biennial reunions and reconnected with his buddies from the battalion during those years. And here's my dad right here in the middle. One of uh, his fellow officers, Major Willoughby, said this in uh, one of the things that he wrote. The 268th FA Battalion, though officially inactive, remains very much alive in the memories of its former members and their families. Those days in World War II profoundly shaped the lives of all of us. We soldiers and families responded to the call to duty with a full measure of youthful energy and dedication. We have cause to be proud of our effort and the part we played in shaping the history of this great nation. I've been able to contact the families of three of these men. So this is Harvey Willoughby. So I've been in contact with his son, Brian, and I, I do think that some of these folks are actually tuning in today, which pleases me. And uh, this, this is Howard McBee, and his son, Bill, has been in touch with me as well. And then this is Jim Young, 
and I've been in communication with Dan and Lucinda Young. So, um, so it, it, I believe that they are participating. So this is the story of their dad's experiences as well. These letters were written by our dad during his experience in the war and they were saved by his two sisters, his mother and grandmother and by our mother, Helen Louise. I was fortunate to be the recipient of these letters and the two scrapbooks that dad assembled when he returned from the war. After organizing and reading all of these letters, a narrative emerged that told the story of his experience. I included direct quotes from his letters and photos and news articles from his scrapbooks. And this became a book that was published last year from Cornfield to Battlefield. This book is available on Amazon in paperback or in the Kindle version and copies are also available to check out at the DeKalb and Sycamore libraries. I have a few things that I wanted to show you. So I think we have time for that. This is my mom's Red Cross hat. So while she was at Fort Sill and uh, down in Texas at Camp Walters, she took Red Cross training. And so some of the soldiers who were in hospitals uh, for various reasons, they, she, they would be visited by the Red Cross um, volunteers and also came in handy for her because she had such a home economics training. So part of what they were talking about was nutrition and just taking care of oneself. I also have my dad's hat and um, this would be his dress hat for when he was in his dress uniform. And when we were kids, of course, this was in the attic and we would play with that. We had a lot of costumes from my dad's uh, war artifacts. Here's his actual dog tags and these are actually pictured on the back of the book. Um, so that the two dog tags that identify him in case that there was some kind of an injury or um, he was mortally wounded. This is an example of one of the letters that my dad wrote. Um, you can see that possibly you can see that it doesn't exactly say where he was in Holland. He always had to say somewhere in Germany or somewhere in Holland because he couldn't um, let anyone know exactly where he was because of, uh, in case he was captured by the Germans. Also, these letters were censored and dad was one of the censors. So he knew uh, what you should not put into your letters. Also, I wanted to show you, this is a mess kit and that would be important for when they were in battle. And this would be something that dad probably had to use quite a bit. So um, I thank you all. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'll just pause a second. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am going to allow everybody to unmute themselves if you want to, to ask questions. You are also welcome to type them into the chat function. Marty, we had no questions during the presentation. Um, but everybody is now allowed to unmute themselves and let's see how that works with 40 people here. And while, while people are thinking of the, Beverly, did you have a question? Nope. Nope. <laughs> um, while people are thinking of questions, um, I did want to mention that we have recorded Marty's presentation today for our friends who couldn't be here with us live. Um, and we will be putting it up on the library early next week, the library's website. Um, and it can be found in our media library on our Just for Adults and our Just for Seniors page and as an item in library news as well. So um, if somebody couldn't make it today that you, you know would um, appreciate this type of presentation, please feel free to let them know that it will be posted on the library's website. I am going to share my screen quickly here with you guys and put up the QR code. So here's the QR code in case you want to do the survey and we encourage as much surveying as possible. Um, we, want, we want feedback because we want to know uh, what works best for you and uh, what, what, you like, what you'd like to see more of and any issues that you had during the program. So again, that's your QR code up on the screen. If you just open your camera function and point your phone at it, 
It should work on most phones. Sometimes on a phone, you do have to download an app to do that. Most phones, though, you do just use the camera function and then it'll pop up with the survey on your screen. Another way, and I'm gonna stop showing that now, another way is by the link, and I'm gonna give that to you right now. I'm gonna put it in the chat function, if my computer allows me to do so. I'm a little clunky with my copy ability here. Okay. And there is the link. Again, I just put it into the chat function. And it looks like we had a few people typing in the chat function. Um, trying to find out if there's any questions. Um, Kathy wanted to say phenomenal presentation, Marty, and awesome, awesome documentation. Um, great presentation. Thank you. And what else do we have here? We've got a long one. Bum, bum, bum. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I am a teacher, also a retired Army uh, artillery officer, like your father was, served in Afghanistan. I would love to share your presentation with my students and read a copy of your book with your permission, if possible. And Marty, I can pass along that gentleman's um, email address that he gave to, to me in the chat function. So, wonderful. Um, Somebody would like to hear more about your interactions with Grandpa Lou's comrades. Yes, I'd be glad to respond to that. So um, I wanted, I wanted uh, to say that he did a lot of writing to his farmhouse fraternity buddies, and he tracked where they were and what was going on with them. And Don Mosier, who was at Oak Crest here in DeKalb, 103 years old, and I have been in contact with each other because he would write to Don and Don would write to Dad and he was a fraternity brother. So um, I've interviewed Don as getting ready for the book. So he's quoted in the book. And uh, so he's a part of our community today. So another one of dad's uh, fraternity buddies uh, recently passed away, but I was able to interview him a couple times as well. And as, as far as uh, the people who are the children, although we're in our 60s and 70s of dad's um, battalion buddies. I, I see that um, the youngs are here. Hello. I'm very excited to see you and probably others as well. That has been a real joy to me to uh, reach out to them and for them to respond back to me. And I think we are going to have our own little Zoom sometime so that we can talk about the book and talk about our dads because they went, the, their fathers went to the same reunions that my dad went to as well. So they knew each other well. And so it'll be really fun to have our own little sidebar sometime. Marty, we have one more question here. Was there any point in your father's life that he did speak about his wartime experiences? Or yes, I, oh, go ahead. We've got a, a follow up to that question, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I found a, a stack of index cards that he had used for notes for doing a, a speech to a group. And maybe my sisters know what group that was. But he, he definitely uh, was ready for a presentation. I suppose he did more than that, but not very often. Um, I don't think that dad uh, really uh, did much speaking to people about his experiences. Um, he was asked to give a presentation to Millican University because he knew the person who was teaching the class and this was actually right before dad died, but um, it was a peace class. And he, I think he was nervous about what, the, what questions would be asked of him about his war experiences. So he declined to speak. But um, as far as our own family discussions, as I indicated earlier, we did not really talk too much about the war when he was growing up and shame, of, shame on us. Perhaps we were all involved in our own lives and didn't think to ask him very much about that, even as we got into our 30s and 40s and 50s. So when these letters became, um, when they surfaced later on, we came up with a lot of questions that we would have asked dad, but by then it was too late. He had already died. So um, yeah, if you have a chance to talk to your parents about some of their experiences, this is the time to do it. So what's the follow-up question? 
Um, let's see. It was, or if not, if he didn't speak about his wartime experiences, then all you know about them are from his letters and scrapbook, correct? Except for one videotape, uh, in 1984, he was sitting at a dining room table and uh, with us and discussing his early life, his childhood, and his war experiences, and we did get that on videotape. So I'm, I, refer that, I refer to that in my book as well, uh, as one of the references. So. And then we did have another question. How long did it take for you to read through all of the materials to discover the narrative? <laughs> It really took a long time. So I just broke it into three different parts and that'd be three different years. And of course I didn't work on it the whole time, but I took off the month of January from my job at the DeKalb Library. And um, then I could dive into the letters and it did take a while to get, get them in order because some of them did not have the dates. So I had to figure out contextually where that letter would fit in and sometimes stationary would match the letter before it. So once that was done, then I had the pre-Europe section that I wrote and then the first part of Europe, his Europe experience, and then the end of it. And then I just let it all sit for another year. And then I took another January off and wrote it, put it all together and added the pictures, which was the fun part for me to put in the maps and the pictures and things like that. So, and then thanks to my son, Matt, um, he was able to help me publish it on, self-publish it on Amazon. So any one of you can write a book. <laughs> and it's free. It is free. You, you get your, uh, your own USPN number. And, um, but it, it, it does help to have someone, unless you're naturally talented in technology, it helps someone like, to have someone like my son who was able to help me with the formatting and to just be able to make sense of how to put an, um, my, my writing, my narrative uh, up onto Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, if you got help, it's easy. <laughs> Marty, we have another question. Did you notice a significant difference in tone in his letters to his mother versus his <laughs> young wife? Oh, that is such a great question. Oh. Um, yes. Yes, the letters that he wrote to his mother and grandmother who were living together very often referred to church <laughs> and what service he had been to. Was it Presbyterian, hopefully Lutheran? <laughs> Wanted to make sure it was went really hardly ever got to have communion. And he would apologize to his mother during the Battle of the Bulge saying, I have not been to church very much <laughs> lately, you know. <laughs> and uh, so that that was the tone for his letters and, all, and also all the tone on all the letters he would downplay the really serious horrible things that he was involved in and he would talk more about the ping pong table that they set up and send more uh, chocolate and that kind of thing and then what I enjoyed uh, when I was reading all this was to know more about the home front because dad was a prolific letter writer, but those that he was writing to were very, very generous in how many letters they wrote to him. And so he would respond to them. And uh, so I would know what was happening at my mom's high school. And I would know what was happening on the farm. And I would know about my aunt's new teaching assignment. And I would know that this uh, rather shy aunt who was a music teacher, wrote to my dad at one point and said she's thinking about quitting her job and working in a munitions factory. Wow. And my dad wrote back, <laughs> he said, no, I really think you're helping the world better by teaching. <laughs> so that, the one tone of, to my grandmother and great-grandmother, as I told you, was uh, often very church-related. And then, of course, when he wrote to my mom at first, I was a little embarrassed about some of the things that he wrote to her because they were quite lovey-dovey. <laughs> you know, like, you know, how, how he felt when he was going to bed and that kind of thing. So then when he would write to his sisters, um, it was much, much more lighthearted, I guess you would say, kind of a jokester. And um, 
you know, I hate to call him a smart aleck, but he was just, he was kind of like that. You know, he was just get, bringing in a whole lot of humor. He was seeing the world and that kind of thing. So that kind of humor, when you, when you would switch to that letter, because they would be written some of them the same day. And so you could see what he wrote to his mom, and then you would see what he wrote to my Uncle Don. And it was just like, okay, same guy, but a different tone. <laughs> so, yes, very different tones in the letters. All right, did we have any further questions for Marty? Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about now, now what? So some of you are probably wondering, now what? So I have the letters and archived uh, plastic folders, and then I have ordered archive, an archival box to put them in, mm -hmm. and I have ordered archival boxes to put these very dilapidated scrapbooks in. They seem to, every time I lift them, more little paper shreds fall off of them. So what our generation is doing is putting it in order, writing the book, and also um, just putting in an archived uh, type of protection. And what we think we're gonna do then, we have a nephew, Adam, who um, will receive all of this, and, and then we're gonna leave it to that generation as to what is to be done with it. Um, will, will we keep them or will we donate the letters to two or three sources that we know about? So um, it's been our job to organize it and to preserve it. And um, my nephew has dad's um, army uniforms. And so we just kind of feel like our job is to get it organized and then see what happens after that. Okay. Well, if nobody has any more questions for Marty, I think that that brings an end to today's presentation. Marty, thank you so much for, for doing this for the library. I and I wanted to say thank you to Samantha and Meg at the DeKalb Library for assisting me in my presentation. And thanks to all of you for participating in this program. Yes, we were, we're very happy we could have made, we could make this happen virtually. Um, I know this isn't the forum that a lot of us would like to be in, but it, it is the one that we unfortunately will be in for a while. So I'm glad that we got such a good turnout for mm -hmm. the virtual program. But thank you everybody so much. Um, and thank you, Marty, for, for doing this for the library. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave the meeting open for a couple more minutes here. Um, the link I've posted in the chat function, so feel free to do that. But um, the, I'll close out the meeting in a couple minutes, but I'm going to leave it open for a little while. You won't see me anymore, but feel free to chat if you want to.